Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Warren Lecture Series. Uh, today's lecture will be given by Peter Grassel from the University of Glasgow. I have a short bio for Peter. So he got his uh, civil engineering diploma from Aachen, Germany, in '94. Then he, uh, for his master's, he went to uh, uh, Göteborg, Sweden, uh, Ch uh, Ch uh, Chalmers University, and then he did, at the same university, he did PhD in 2004. Then he spent two years as a research associate at, uh, at uh, EPFL Lausanne, and eventually another two years at uh, Northwestern University with Zdenek Bazant, and from 2006, he's now at the University of Glasgow. And with that, please welcome the speaker. So, uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, so I also would like to thank um, Emmanuel for inviting me um, to this, where is he actually, um, for, for this um, invitation to this um, seminar that is, uh, was very kind and I was very happy to accept this, to come here to present my research. Um, it's it's uh, something that I have been working on for the last probably um, six years in total, but in the last three years we were really looking at the modeling of the coupling of fracture and transport. So the talk today is about the lattice modeling of fracture and transport. Um, and as, as, as was said, my name is Peter Grassel and I'm from the University of Glasgow. So before I start to present the, the results and our modeling approach, I would like to do the most important thing and to acknowledge the help of some of my um, students and co-workers. And um, these, this is like a picture that we took um, 2011 when a few of us went up um, Conic Hill, which is like a small hill close to Glasgow. And you can see here in this picture the three students who worked on lattice modeling with me together in the last years. And here on the left is uh, Demetrius Xenos. Then here next, next to him is um, Ignatius Athanasiades. You can see this is like some Greek theme. And then here on the very right, we have um, Caroline Fai, who is from Ireland originally. Um, and just to mention, <laughs> that there was one, one visiting PhD student, Jonas, from Sweden, but um, he was actually not working on lattice modeling. So these three are really the main three um, students I've been working with on the results that I'm going to present here. But there were plenty of visitors and collaborators with other universities that I'm going to mention throughout my talk. At the moment, we have funding from the EPSRC, which is like the British um, equivalent to the NSF, and um, also RWM, which is uh, part of the Nuclear Decommission Authority in the UK. <clears throat> so just to give you a, f a feeling of Glasgow and the, the place where I'm from, I would like to show you another view of this Conic Hill. Um, actually, it's from, from the top of Conic Hill downwards. <coughs> and and that's, that's how it looks like. And that is approximately 30 minutes away from the university, from the city itself. So there's plenty of opportunity for very nice hill walking and um, beautiful countryside. So before I start presenting my, my modeling and my results, I would like to give you some background of the processes that I'm modeling and that I'm trying to model. So this is like a few examples of naturally occurring hydraulic fracturing, where we have sills and dikes uh, formed in, in rock, rock masses. And you can see here a length scale of um, something like 40 centimeters and uh, two meters. Um, and just keep this in mind, because on the next slide, I would like to show you Another example of, in my opinion, hydraulic fracturing that occurs on a very, very different length scale. So we have here the application of corrosion-induced cracking, and that was actually the topic of Caroline Fai and during her PhD, where during the transformation of steel into rust, we have this um, accompanying volume change, the increase of volume, because the rust has a much lower density. But when it starts to form, it's actually more like a fluid than a solid. And this fluid, due to the pressure that is generated at the interface between the steel and the um, concrete, is pushed into the porous material, the concrete. So the material is pushed into the pores, cracking occurs, and the material is then further on pushed into these microcracks. So here at the bottom, <coughs> what you see here is a close-up of the interface between the reinforcement bar and the surrounding concrete. And it's bit difficult to see because it shows only a very small cut of the reinforcement bar. So that's like the top part, this S stands for steel, 
And it's the top part of this reinforcement bar, which would look like this in a circular shape. And you have here the rust layer forming at the interface. And here you have some micro-cracking in which the rust products are pushed into. And here in this bigger pores that we have close to the, the reinforcement bar. This is actually a picture that was taken by collaborators at the um, concrete durability group at Imperial College. So another example. So here we have two examples where really the fluid pressure causes the cracking and the change of the um, material response. But here's an example where, um, where we have uh, a sandstone in which um, water uh, ingresses on the, on the bottom. And due to this um, water pressure inside the sample, we have a change of the material response in the shear band forms here. So that is not really the, the fluid pressure itself that causes the cracking, but the presence of the fluid pressure causes a different failure mode like a shear failure here because we have this um, sample subjected to some mechanical load at the same time as the fluid pressure is injected at the bottom. Um, and so again, we have here the fluid pressure that causes the, the failure in the material. But very often we have also some mechanical loading that is initiated first, and that leads to cracking, which change the transport properties inside the material. That is also in a very important application. So an example of this is, for instance, a heterogeneous material, which is here a, a, a type of concrete, which is subjected to drying. And um, the matrix around these darker, stiff inclusions um, shrinks more than the inclusions themselves. And this differential shrinkage of inclusions and matrix leads to micro-cracking in some cases, if the drying happens quickly enough. And um, these cracks can be seen here, connecting these um, inclusions and going at the boundary of these inclusions, going across. Really important here is um, that although these, these cracks ca are very small, so this is here one millimeter, um, they can lead to a um, strong change of um, the permeability of the material when it is then subsequently subjected to a pressure gradient. So the fluid itself might not cause this cracking, it's caused by something else, although shrinkage is of course related to a loss of the moisture inside the material, but it's different to the hydraulic fracturing. But then the cracking itself leads to a permeability change. And um, another example of this is shown here, where we have um, a section of a beam that was pre-cracked, so we crack first the beam, so that is only um, the middle part of this beam. You need to imagine that it's continuous in this direction. Here, if you don't see it, there's a crack starting from the um, bottom of this beam going up to the top. And then the bottom of this beam is subjected to, to the fluid, which um, in this case was water. And the water um, goes into this beam because it's made of a porous material but it goes much quicker along the crack. It's uh, sucked up into the crack using, due to capillary action. And then it goes from the discrete crack into the surrounding material. So we have this interaction of, of um, flow along cracks, but also from the crack into the porous material. Uh, and and, and um, this combination of cracking, uh, discrete flow, and then continuous flow into the intact material is something that I'm interested in modeling. And um, if you are now, and I, I know that in your case that's not, that's not a, it really matters because you all probably work on something that you, 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 have, you, or you are at a place where you have heard these applications many times before. But if you wouldn't be able to relate your, 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 yourself to any of this, you can always imagine this application of um, dunking your biscuit into your tea or your coffee. Because what there happens is something... Um, that you bring the biscuit in contact with the fluid. The fluid gets sucked up into the porous biscuit due to capillary action, and that leads to a change of the connection of the biscuit grains inside because the sugar is dissolved and you have some swelling occurring as well, and that leads to a disintegration of the biscuit, which could land up in your tea. That's actually some, or coffee, if you prefer coffee. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm from the UK, so therefore I was thinking about tea. Um, <laughs> If you, if, you, if you look here at the reference, there's actually a very nice nature paper written on this. And it's not about the, not about the science of um, dunking the biscuit into oh. the fluid, although it's mentioned as well. But it's actually more that they had used this as some, um, with some, um, some, some, some study to um, um, get more attraction towards their, their, 
um, this kind of research and it was picked up by almost all media outlets because the idea that someone is researching the behavior of biscuits being put into the tea showed a much greater interest than any Nobel Prize winner would ever, <laughs> would, would ever attract. So they write about this experience they had um, when they published this story and it's actually a very good read so I can recommend to look this up. Okay, so let me come now to a quick, um, let's, let's go now to the real topic of this talk. And let me start with a very um, quick outline of what I'm going to talk here. Uh, the first part, I'm going to introduce the lattice modeling technique that we use. And then I go on to a, quite a big part on verification and validation, mainly showing you some results where we compared our modeling to benchmarks. And I'm going to look at a thick -walled, 2D thick wall cylinder, some size effect analysis we did with these models and also some 3D double cantilever analysis that and always is related to fracture and coupling of fracture to, to transport. Um, however, I think the strength of my, my uh, modeling approach is that I develop is um, not in, in comparing it to analytical uh, solutions or experiments, which is of course very important and fundamental, but it's really the applications where we can then use our modeling to maybe understand certain processes that happen inside the material and explain why we get certain results that we observe in experiments. And that is going to be the last part of my talk where I talk about one of the applications we were looking in the past at. So if you just have a quick um, review of what we could, um, how we could model the mechanical response of materials and the mass transport in materials, let's have maybe some definitions of continuum approaches, hybrid approaches, and discrete approaches. And um, you, I, I think it about like this, that um, in the continuum approach, you, you, you would start with this um, like a differential equation that you would like to solve, and you, you, that, is, that, is your, that is your way, way of approaching it, and you discretize it, and you, you, get, you get your solution from that. And for the discrete approach, we start with a discrete network of, 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 of elements uh, and we, 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 obtain, we obtain a solution from this discrete network which um, in many cases should give us the solution that we would get from the differential equations as well. But you don't go through the formal step of going from this differential equation to this discrete network necessarily. And um, you have then some hybrid approaches where you could have, for instance, um, a continuum approach where you introduce some discontinuities either for discrete flow along cracks or discrete cracking that is embedded in the continuum. And I'm really working on this discrete approaches that I'm going to present you. And I'm going to show you in some applications where there are some situations where we don't, where we're not able to recover all the possible solutions that we would get from directly discretizing the differential equation. So let me start with a 2D um, picture of a 2D discretization that we use for these lattice approaches. So the main idea here is that we have discrete elements, uh, mechanical and discrete transport elements, and, and they are arranged in space to, to form the representation of the response of the material we are interested in modeling. And we usually start with that, that we put first some random points into the dom domain we would like to model, and then we connect these random points, and for that we use Voronoi and Deloney tessellations. So here on the left-hand side, you see examples of these um, irregular lattices that we obtain from this. So we place these random points, these black points, so they would be everywhere here where these um, black lines uh, meet. We would place these random vertices in first. Then we do the Deloney um, tessellation on based of these random um, points, and then a, a dual Voronoi tessellation. So then we use this geometric information of these two networks and we place the mechanical elements on the edges of the um, triangles and the transport or pipe elements we put on the edges of these polygons. So that is our approach and that is something that um, people in Japan have been, have been doing um, for, for quite some while and I think the first original idea or not the first one but some ideas of, uh, related to this um, um, for concrete was also introduced by von Mier already earlier. And uh, we, we um, have published some work on this as well. And the main idea here is by placing these transport elements perpendicular to the mechanical elements is that we could e um, better capture the increase of transport properties due to cracking in the elements. 
And vice versa, if we have here some uh, fluid pressure acting on the, on the transport um, lattice, that, that this could easily affect the mechanical re response um, in these mechanical elements. So here on the right hand, you have a zoom up of these um, elements that connect um, one and two and three and four. So one and two here would be the mechanical element. At each node, we have two translations and one notation. And we calculate at this red point C um, the displacement discontinuity, which is then used um, to evaluate stresses at this point C. So in, in this formulation, the stress would consist of a stress vector of a normal and a shear component. And we could also have, although it wouldn't have necessarily a clear physical meaning, um, a, a rotational component of the um, stresses and strains at this point it's related to the bending. Um, so what we then can do is, once we have the stresses and the strains at this point, the strains are obtained by smearing out the displacement discontinuity over the length of the elements, we can use constitutive models to describe the um, gradual stiffness reduction, for instance, due to cracking that occurs in this element using a nonlinear fracture mechanics approach. And um, for the transport, we would have um, like, uh, the, 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 the pressures here at these nodes, and we would have this one-dimensional description of the flow. But since we have a two-dimensional or later on three-dimensional network, we get a three-dimensional response for the transport within our domain. Okay. Um, so this is like a very clear concept in 2D, and it's easy to understand. And uh, many people say, oh, that's, that's, it's, it's, they say, oh, it's nice. If you have a mechanical element that cracks and you get a crack here across it, of course, the transport should go perpendicular to this. Um, and it's a very, very clear concept. However, most of the problems we are going to look at, um, that, or most of the problems that we are studying are 3D. And very often, it's important to take into account the third dimension. And if you extend this concept of dual Delaunay and Voronoi tessellation to 3D, things are becoming slightly more complicated. And I'm going to show you this on the next slide. And um, that's shown here. <coughs> what you can see here is um, one Delaunay tetrahedron. So we start the game with the same idea. We have here these points that we place randomly in the domain. We have all these points, but now it's 3D. We do a Delaunay and Voronoi tessellation based on these random points. And that gives us um, the Delaunay tetrahedra. And the dual Voronoi tessellation gives us Voronoi polyhedra. So here, this one here is only one facet of one polyhedron that would, for instance, here correspond to this point J and this point I here. So this is the facet, um, the joint facet of these two polyhedron, which would be around I and J. And that is one um, Delaunay tetrahedron that is generated. So now, before we um, placed the mechanical elements on the edges of the Delaunay triangles, and we do here the same, we place the mechanical elements on the edges of the Delaunay tetrahedron. And now, the cross-section of this mechanical element is the facet of the Voronoi polyhedron. Okay, and then for the transport, we place in the same way as before, the transport elements, they stay 1D, and we place them on the edges of the Voronoi polyhedron. So if you do this, you end up with a situation that you have here, for instance, a mechanical element connecting node I and J, that is shown here. So now each node has six degrees of freedom, three rotations and three translations. And um, you have here this cross-section, mid-cross-section, that is used for determining the, the mechanical properties. You would calculate displacement discontinuities at this point C that are then used to determine strains and then your stresses. But you have now here on the boundary of this cross-section um, the, the Voronoi edges. And on these boundaries are the transport elements. So if you have an effect of the transport on the mechanical response, for instance, the fluid pressure is causing a change in the mechanical response, that is determined by um, the pressures in these transport elements that are at the boundary of the cross-section of your mechanical element. So here on the right, we have shown this one edge um, that is shown here, this OP of the, of the one edge of the Voronoi facet. So we have here our transport element placed on this edge. The cross-section the cross of this transport element is um, the facet of the Delaunay um, tetrahedron. And we have here 
three mechanical elements um, at the boundary of our transport element cross-section. So if you have cracking in the mechanical elements, they are going to um, influence the transport properties of this element. So this tr transport element has proper um, properties that are influenced by three mechanical elements here. Oh, by the way, so as you can hear, I'm, I'm, my, my native English is, language is not English, so if you have any problems in understanding me, please feel free to interrupt me and ask, okay? Um, that's here the constitutive model that we use for the mechanical approach. Um, it's, it's a st um, scalar damage model that is very suitable for many <coughs> applications where we have tensile cracking. And it's just shown here schematically as a um, normal stress-strain curve. As I said before, stresses and strains are here vectors. So we have here in 3D, we would have six components of stresses and strains. And therefore, uh, it's slightly more complicated than just showing this one, um, um, 1D response. But it just shows you that as the stiffness, as, as um, the strain increases, we, we are able to describe softening, so decreasing stress with increasing strain. And um, a reduction of the stiffness um, which, which is indicated here. So very important here is that we use a damage evolution that depends on the crack opening. So we have a stress crack opening curve that we use to evaluate our damage model. And in this way, we get results that are mesh independent. And mesh independent means that the crack openings that we compute are independent of the element length. That's very similar to crack band approaches that we use um, in, in, in um, what I would call hybrid approaches. So this is very good for tensile cracking, but very often we have situations where compression is interacting with tension, and then we have to go to more complicated constitutive models such as damage plasticity approaches that are shown here, where we have a combination of damage and plasticity, and then we can describe things like intention, for instance, a reduction of the stresses, a reduction of the stiffness, but we have still these permanent um, strains um, remaining, and here, uh, the, for instance, a compressive response of, um, under um, normal stresses. So in these two formulations that I have shown you here, we had this epsilon t here, which is an eigenstrain that we're going to use later to describe shrinkage in one of those applications that I show you here. So we have here plastic strains, in this case, plus some eigenstrain that we can use to describe thermal effects, for instance, thermal expansion, or shrinkage, as I do later. Um, so here's the transport now, and this is probably a slightly better visualization of how we take into account the cracking of the mechanical elements on the transport properties. So you can see here this one transport element I showed you before, and now we have here the crack width indicated of this um, mechanical elements placed on the boundary of, the mid of this cross-section of this transport element. And um, so what we now have here is when we take into account the cracking on the transport, we do this by um, splitting up the permeability of our transport element, actually this is the conductivity of our transport element, by an initial conductivity, which is the one of the intact material without any influence of cracking, plus a crack contribution. We use here a cubic law. And this cubic law is really um, um, originating from this um, crack width over this crack length here, from the midpoint of the mechanical element to um, the centroid of this um, cross-section. And sometimes, uh, in some later applications, we also look at the case of um, unsaturated material. So this was just the change of the conductivity. And I'm not going to show you all those equations for the unsaturated material. But we use the Van Genuchten approach, and um, that gives us a few more parameters. But the main idea is that we have some capillary suction inside the material. And if the capillary suction is maximum, we would have the smallest um, um, conductivity. Um, and as the conductivity, as the capillary suction um, um, decreases and becomes zero, we would have a fully saturated material. Okay, these are the two, two, two limits it's important to remember for later on. So sometimes we only describe the influence of cracking on the transport, but um, in other applications we have the influence of the fluid, look at the influence of the fluid pressure on the mechanical response. And that is done here by this um, full coupling, where we have here this bio coefficient. So we have the total stress equal to the mechanical stress plus the spiel coefficient times the um, uh, stress vector st originating from the fluid pressure. 
So it's only the normal component that we add to this um, mechanical vector to, to describe the influence of the fluid pressure. Um, so far, we only do this for, for um, the assumption of full saturation. So we don't apply this for the un unsaturated case. However, if you do this, the coupling of these lattices becomes slightly more complicated. Um, in, inside the domain, everything is uh, rather straightforward. But if you come to boundaries, you have to take into account this interaction of the transport and mechanical lattice. And um, for instance, um, here is an example of a, like a, um, a circular boundary. And if you have a certain fluid pressure here acting in the, in the transport lattice, then we need to take into account this fluid pressure as a force on the mechanical um, lattice to, to, to um, have the right boundary condition for the fully, full coupling um, between the two lattices. And we have two approaches for this. We are, we, we are, we are able to control the, um, um, the, the pressure in the transport model, or alternatively, we can also describe, control some um, mechanical displacement that leads to a pressure in our transport model. And um, we're going to use this later to, um, for some of the benchmarks. So this is how to deal with boundaries. And now the last slide that I'm going to show you on my modeling before we go to some results is on the um, cases where we don't want to model any boundaries. And boundaries are always a bit tricky to model. And um, although usually we have boundaries in our applications, sometimes it's nice to get rid of the influence of boundaries completely. And for this, we use periodic cells. And we have developed some special periodic cells for the mechanical and transport model. And this is really something that I have started with um, Milan Jerosek in 2010, and quite recently continued with my PhD student, Ignatius Asanasiades. And the main idea here is that we have one periodic cell in which we um, have our, in which we discretize by our lattice model, but we place the um, nodes um, periodically, so they are, the, the, all these two nodes that we have inside the specimen are repeated periodically in the neighboring cells, and we generate our lattice according to all these nodes. That means we have lattice elements that cross the boundary, and we have special techniques that allows us to analyze this type of um, situation where we have a completely irregular lattice. It's not at all adjusted to the boundaries, and uh, we do this by, for instance, here calculating the response um, of this uh, node J prime, which is not inside our um, cell, by taking into, into, taking into account the information of J plus the gradient of, for instance, displacement that we have applied to this periodic cell. So having, if you know the gradient of the, 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 the displacement that we subject this periodic cell to, then we are able to calculate the displacement of this point J prime without um, having this J prime actually in our degrees of freedom in our model. And the same thing can be done for the transport. So here are transport elements crossing the boundary. This point N prime is not included in our model. Um, but we can take into account this information on n prime by taking this point n plus the pressure gradient that we have applied to this periodic cell. So we have the situation to apply here a, a strain or a pressure gradient to these periodic cells with, with, without having any influence of the boundaries on our arrangement of these lattice elements. In 2D, in this sketch, one might be able to follow what's going on with these elements, but um, even if you look at a very small arrangement in 3D, it becomes very complicated. Therefore, I didn't try to explain the interaction of those nodes in the 3D example. Um, but what you can see here when you look at this, this is the mechanical cell. And the brown elements are the, me the mechanical elements. The blue ones are the transport elements, which form the cross-section of this um, mechanical elements. And you can really see here the Voronoi polyhedron in the blue cells and the Delaunay triangles, a tetrahedra in the, from the brown elements. And that is then the other way around. Here we have a transport cell. The blue elements are still the transport ones, and the brown ones are the mechanical ones. But um, now the brown ones are the cross-sections of these blue elements. So let's go on to some verification and validation. And the first example I want to look at is a 2D thick wall cylinder. And that was mainly to um, get a check if we are able to describe really the coupling of transport and mechanical response. And we are also interested in checking if we can do this mesh independently. 
So that we don't have a strong influence of the um, refinement of the lattice on these results. And that is like a paper that we have published quite recently in 2015. Um, so if you want to look this up. And the main idea here was to have this thick walled cylinder with the uh, inner fluid pressure applied. And we, we um, specified some dimensionless variables. And now we um, looked initially at the mechanical response without any cracking. So it's, it's purely elastic. But we took into account the fluid pressure on the mechanical response using this BO coefficient. So if you would imagine that this is a non-porous material, or you have something that seals here, this inner boundary, and you apply a fluid pressure, what happens is that this inner boundary is pushed outwards, and this thick wall cylinder gets thinner by having this fluid pressure pushing outwards. Um, however, when we switched on um, the influence of the fluid pressure on the mechanical response, we noticed that in some cases, we get um, different effects that I'm going to show you now in a moment. So, this is a standard solution that you can find in many articles for the pressure distribution, for the case that we have only an inner pressure and no outer pressure. This is this logarithmic relationship with respect to this um, radius r. And here is the um, equation for the radial displacement that we derived. And actually, there are some well, actually this uh, formulation was already published in 1970 for the case that v is equal to 1, so the case of the um, um, Tasagi principle. Um, however, and for um, B equal to zero, it's a very standard case that is in almost every textbook on, 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 on mechanics. Uh, but we looked also at some intermediate cases where, where B is between zero and one. And, and that's what we um, described in this um, article. So now we use our lattice model to describe this. That is the mechanical model, that is the transport model. Some input here, and look what happens to this pressure distribution. And we know the analytical solution that I just have shown you, and that is the numerical solution that we obtain with the lattice. So we have a very good match of these two solutions. Um, and then when we go to the mechanical response, um, we get um, um, this kind of agreement. So on this axis here, we have the radial displacement normalized, and on this axis here, we have the radius. So let's maybe focus first on this case B equal to zero, so a non-porous material. So as you go away from the inner radius, which is for the dimension as variables r bar equal to 1, and you go to the outer um, boundary, the radial displacement decreases. So that's what I said before. The inner boundary is pushed outwards, and your thick wall cylinder gets thinner by this uh, fluid pressure. However, as you increase B, and you have a stronger effect of the fluid pressure on the mechanical response, you can see that for B equal to 1, the outer radial displacement is larger than the inner one. So we have a stretching, a, th a thickening of the thick wall cylinder. But for us, it was important to show that we can reproduce these responses using our lattice model, this analytical solution. So again, circles, numerical, and the solid line is the analytical solution. So now we said, OK, that works fine. Let's go on to the mechanical response when we switch on cracking. So we have some nonlinearities occurring. We increase this fluid pressure. Cracking should start inside the material, and these, should crack, these cracks should propagate outwards. And before I show you the crack patterns, here are the relationship between the, the inner radial displacement at the inner boundary. And here on the vertical axis, you have the fluid pressure that increases, all dimensionless. And here are the responses we get for a coarse, medium, and fine lattice for the case of different values of this BO coefficient. So this is a in principle, a pure mechanical problem for B equal to zero, that we have an increasing force, and um, that leads to this nonlinear response in our mechanical um, uh, model. So we, we, cracking occurs, initially it's elastic, cracking occurs, and then we reach eventually the peak here, and um, we have a very strong effect of the fluid pressure on this mechanical response. So if we go to B equal to one in our model, we have a strong reduction of this um, peak load. And here are the crack patterns that we get for the cases B equal to 0 and 1. So you can see here it, it would start initially with cracking at this inner boundary. And as you then increase the uh, uh, fluid pressure, the cracking uh, travels outwards. And um, depending on this BO coefficient, we get also different type of crack patterns. So uh, for, for this one here, um, these are for the fine, medium, and coarse mesh. We get, we get mm, two main cracks, whereas here for the mechanical problem, we get more than two cracks. And that was repeated in all the analysis that we had for different mesh sizes. 
Um, so these are active cracks. So these are cracks uh, at this final stage or at, at peak where damage still uh, increases at this moment. So interesting is also that for the different meshes, there's no predefined direction of these cracks. They appear wherever they want to appear. Uh, um, so we have a rotation of these crack patterns um, because it's a completely random where they travel. Uh, and that is not predefined by anything in the model. OK, let's go on. And let's have a look at a pure mechanical problem. Um, uh, um, that's true, actually. I have a pure mechanical problem. I haven't thought about that. Um, it's a 2D size effect analysis. But it's a comparison to some experimental results that um, we found were quite interesting. And that was a study that was done by um, Piaget de Cabot um, and um, David Gregoire and um, Laura Solano on, on um, three-point bending beams of different size, but also different notch lengths. So they had different boundary conditions. And they looked at how the size effect is influenced by the different um, length of the notches. So this went from zero notch length to, to a very large notch length. And that is like the grammatical arrangement of the specimen. You have these two supports, one um, loud in the center, and this is here this notch length, length that was varied, and the size was scaled up as well. And so these two influences were investigated, beam size and notch length. So our aim was just to see since this was a, quite a big experimental study with different sizes and different notch lengths, are we able to reproduce these experimental results with our lattice model? And for that, is we, we looked at these um, input parameters we needed for our lattice model. We did a, like a mesoscale analysis of this. So we had different properties for inclusions, uh, matrix, and um, interfaces. But in the end, by um, selecting reasonable ratios of um, input parameters, we ended up with only two free parameters that we could really tune to get this model response. And so um, we did like an inverse analysis by only changing the tensor strength of the matrix and the fracture energy of the matrix. So all the other parameters were following these two values based on some predefined ratios that we, we had selected before. So these were the only two free parameters. And these are the results that we obtain here. It's an inverse analysis, okay? We, we really tuned the parameters to get the best fit. And you can argue, you can say, oh, wait a moment, why, why didn't you tune it better? Because the solid curve here is the model response, and the dashed lines here is the um, experimental results. And this is for the smaller size, and then the next size, and this one is for the bigger size. On this axis, you have the load, and here the crack mouth opening displacement, which is the opening of the notch at the bottom of this beam. So you can argue, why didn't you get a better fit here? The reason for this is that we did this for different notch lengths. That is the longest notch, then the medium notch, and the short notch. We wanted to get for all three notch lengths the, 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 a good fit. So if you go to the next notch size, 0.2, again here, this is the solid line, is here the, um, the, the numerical answer with the standard deviations because we did 100 analyses of each of those um, analysis, mesoscale simulations. And then you have here the dashed line is the experimental picture. And overall, looking at these different notch lengths and the agreement of the model and the numerical sites, really thought that this, this uh, model is capable of reproducing this um, size effect that was observed in the, in the experiments. Not only that, it was also able to reproduce this influence of the notch length because we get a reasonable agreement for all the three cases. Okay. So the last um, example of verification and validation that I would like to present before I go on to the application is this 3D double cantilever. And that is something that we are actually, it's new results that we haven't published yet. We are just about to submit the article. And who knows when it is going to be published then. That could take years. Um, <laughs> um, let's have a look at the setup of the analysis. So some of you can share this experience. So it's nice. Um, it's um, a sequential analysis where we first have this eccentric force applied to the specimen. And we have here a notch on the left. And we introduce a crack into this um, specimen. And then we stop at a certain point and um, subject um, this initially unsaturated material to, to a fluid um, pressure equal to zero on the left boundary, which would mean that we assume that we have a re fluid reservoir here that allows the fluid to travel into the specimen from the left to the right. And we expect that it will travel along this crack that is in the specimen and then from the crack into the surrounding material. We wanted to see if we can describe this mesh independently. And this is the first part here. 
It's, uh, it's um, uh, the mechanical simulation that we do. And that's just an example of the coarse mesh, but we looked at different mesh refinements um, for this mechanical lattice. Um, and um, we apply um, the load and measure the displacement at the point where the load is applied. And we obtain forced displacement curves that are really literally independent of the lattice size due to our approach of modeling damage based on the stress crack opening curve that I have mentioned before at the beginning. And at this point here, we, we plot here the crack patterns because this is the point where we then you do the transport analysis. So we stopped in one of those simulations at this point already and didn't go continue the analysis to the end. And then applied here the, the zero fluid pressure for this initially unsaturated material and model the transport into the, into the specimen. So here are first the crack patterns that we obtained for this coarse, medium, and fine. And um, you can see here only um, cross-section elements of elements, uh, so cross-sections of elements in which the crack opening is larger than 10 microns. Um, and so these are the cross-sections of the elements in which the um, crack opening is larger than 10 microns. And you can see that they go all, for all three analyses to the same length. And they're all in the middle of the specimen. And then we um, perform the transport analysis, where we have this initially um, uh, saturation of 0 0.5 in the specimen. And then apply here this zero fluid um, pressure on the left. And this is just an example of the transport lattice based on the edges of the Voronoi polyhedron. That is the inflow for the three coarse, medium, and fine lattices. And that shows you that it is more or less mesh independently described. And um, then finally, this is the time here on this axis and the ratio of the volume of fluid going into the specimen. And then here are contour plots of the fluid pressure. So black means that we have zero fluid pressure that's fully saturated. And this gray, which you can't see very well here, uh, here in this region, means that this initial saturation of 0 0.5. And that is after 3.33 hours for the input that we have chosen. And this plot here shows a cut through the specimen in this direction. And you can see that the um, fluid pressure is very large along this crack. But the crack went uh, along this specimen in this direction. The crack plane was actually in this direction here. So the crack would go along this line here. But we have uh, transport from the crack into the surrounding material occurring at the same time. So we are able to re reproduce this um, interaction of the intact material into the surrounding material with this model. And that is another cut um, across the specimen like this. And um, actually now, now looking at this, this should, should have been rotated by 90 degrees. Uh, sorry for that. And you can see that we have like this um, highest value of the uh, fluid pressure in the center of the crack. And then it's uh, traveling from the crack into the surrounding material. <coughs> Just imagine that they are rotated by 90 degrees. Okay. Okay, that's, that's it. That's just a verification and validation of my model. And now um, the last part, I hope I have still a few minutes left, I would like to spend on an application where we investigated um, the influence of microcracking on transport. And that is really based on some experimental results of my collaborators, Hong Wong and um, Nick Bühnfeld at Imperial College which had the situation that they looked at um, shrinkage drying of concrete, and they, had, they looked at the influence of aggregates on the shrinkage drying. So they dried these specimens and then measured the transport properties, and they found out that if they had specimens with large inclusions in it, large aggregates, they always ended up with a much larger permeability after the drying than for the case where they had small inclusions in it, although the specimens are subjected to the same drying. And they were looking at the crack patterns they obtained in the specimens, and they noticed, um, for, they noticed these, um, this um, cracking that occurred due to this drying. And they were suspecting, or they were suggesting, that the change of permeability stems from the difference in the crack openings they obtained for the case of small inclusions and large inclusions. When I say influence of small inclusions and large inclusions, I mean that the volume fraction of inclusions stays the same. It's just the, um, the size of the inclusions was varied. So with small inclusions, there would have many more inclusions there. So we did 2D modeling of this, and we obtained, um, this, uh, with this, we obtained here these crack patterns that were um, going from these inclusions, um, between these inclusions. And we noticed that we changed 
the um, size of these inclusions that um, we would get for small inclusions more cracks, but the crack openings would be smaller. Um, and if we then applied a cubic law to describe the flow in the out-of-plane direction, um, of, of course, we would get a smaller conductivity. So that was quite, quite logical. And we observed a very large increase of the crack permeability with aggregate diameter. So the question is now, what happens if we get this cracking? What happens here to the out-of-plane um, direction? Is this of importance, how thick the specimen is to describe these effects? And we wanted to look at this by um, studying a 3D lattice approach by applying a 3D lattice approach to this problem, by studying it with a 3D lattice approach. And let's start with this periodic cell I introduced at the beginning. That was applied to this now here. We have this periodic cell, and there's one spherical inclusion in it, shown here in 2D, but modeled in 3D. And now you need to imagine that this inclusion is repeated in all directions because we have this periodic cell. So when we get cracking, uh, then it is due to the interaction of inclusions that are in the neighboring cells that I haven't shown here, but it's the periodic boundary conditions we apply. Um, what we then here um, looked at is like the influence of the diameter of these inclusions. And uh, we have some input parameters for the mechanical and the transport. Uh, so we assume that the inclusion is stiffer than the matrix. But for the transport, we assume that the conductivity of the inclusion is much lower than the conductivity of the surrounding matrix. So when we now apply a shrinkage strain to the specimen, the inclusion doesn't shrink. It's only the matrix that shrinks. And due to this restraint of this non-shrinking inclusions, we get crack patterns in this, in this cell. And these crack patterns look like this for this one periodic cell. And maybe you can see this already by looking at it like this. We get very regular um, crack planes due to this interaction um, that we have with neighboring inclusions that we don't see because it's a periodic cell. And I just wanted to see if I can run this here. Um, I just rotate the specimen. So you have this inclusion in the middle, uh, middle and you have here these um, three crack, crack planes that are um, obtained. And if you change you know, the size of the inclusion, that would mean that we have many more crack, cracks in the specimen. But uh, the crack width are going to be smaller. And here, these blue lines show the preferential transport along these cracked uh, elements. Remember, we have our carpet lattice, and we describe the transport along these cracked elements. And you can see, although we have these regular crack planes, the transport, the large transport, is really aligned in the direction in which we applied the pressure gradient, which is like um, in this direction, the vertical direction. And then we then look at the influence of the inclusion. We reproduce what we already explained in 2D and just by thinking about this problem, that when you apply the shrinkage strain, cracking starts to occur. And as you increase the shrinkage strain and the matrix shrinks more and more, the cracks open more and more, and we have an increase of our permeability, which we have here plotted on the vertical axis due to a constant pressure gradient applied to the specimen. And as we change the size of the inclusion and increase it, the influence of this cracking gets bigger and bigger because the crack width gets bigger, but the number of cracks gets smaller. Since we have the cubic law, the crack width is a more than dominant influence. So now about the influence of the out-of-plane thickness of our specimen. So we have now a random arrangement of these inclusions, and we looked at um, 25, 50, and um, 75 millimeter thick specimens. We have again this pressure gradient applied to it, but the mechanical model is again shrinkage of the matrix, which is restrained by these aggregates. And if you see here these crack patterns that develop, they look very um, random and complicated, and it's probably also a nice idea to rotate this model to see better what happens here. You can see here these crack planes really um, traveling between these inclusions that we have here. And it was important for us to check that this is again mesh independent. And it is because it starts initially to crack in a distributed manner in the entire specimen, but then these individual cracks localize, and the number of the cracks is um, governed by the spacing of these aggregates and the size of these aggregates. And we, we check this, that we get a mesh independent answer even for these results. And we have the dominant flow of the fluid through these crack planes in this 3D arrangement. And then we could look at the influence of the specimen size, uh, the, sorry, specimen, the out of plane thickness of the specimen. And we looked at 25, which is the smallest, and then 50 and 75. And you can see here that if you have a very thin specimen, we have an increase of the permeability. And as we then go to 50 and 75, the curves 
the green and the blue curves lie really on each other. There's very little difference. So as you, as you have to reach a certain thickness of the specimen and you increase it further, the permeability due to cracking doesn't change anymore. So because the connect probably there's no, no influence of the thickness because for the very thin one, the, really the connectivity is increased by having this more thickness, but as you increase it to a certain level, it has no influence anymore. But what we can see is as we increase the specimen, the outer plane thickness, the standard deviation, which is shown here by these ranges around these points, is de de decreased significantly. Because this is not one simulation we have done, but a number of random simulations for different arrangements of inclusions. So this was just an example of, of an analysis where we used this lattice model to investigate the influence of this shrinkage restraint, um, aggregate restraint shrinkage, and um, looked at how the in inclusion size influence the permeability due to cracking for constant volume fraction and also an in influence on the um, effect of the out-of-plane thickness of our specimens. So at this point, I just would like to sum up everything and just explain to you that we have, that we have here proposed a, a lattice model for transport and um, the mechanical response, which we think in many cases could be um, better than continuum approaches for describing these complicated crack patterns that we have in many situations. Because for continuum approaches, we are in many cases able to track individual cracks, how they propagate to our medium. But if we have 100 to 400 interacting cracks, it, it, it becomes very difficult to do this. And then these discrete approaches, uh, the one that uh, is particularly this lattice approach that I have presented here, might be um, more advantageous to, to do this. And that's what I wanted to show you here. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. As all of you know, recorded presentation. Well, <clears throat> thank you for a um, really great presentation. I, um, I have a, uh, two questions. One of them, in your analytical solution for fixed cylinder, you showed that like, Poisson's ratio has a significant effect on the, on the, on the response. But... My understanding that orig uh, the original Balandas formulation assumes that Poisson's ratio is zero. How did you <coughs> reconcile this? Okay, so I mean the analytical solution. Um, uh, sorry, maybe we should go quickly back because the analytical solution shows an influence of Poisson's ratio. Um, the, the effect that I showed here no, was no, really the, here, here, yeah, no, the, the effect that I showed in my analysis was really the influence of bio coefficient. And these simulations that I show here were performed for Poisson's ratio of zero which is the original Bolanda case. But what I wanted to um, say here concerning this analytical solution, yes, process ratio is in here, and it has an effect on the, on the answer. And we show this in, in the paper in more detail, where we look, also compare our numerical size to, this, to the cases for process ratio not equal to zero. But when we do this, yeah, but if we, when we do this, and we um, select our lattice model so that we describe Poisson's ratio not equal to zero, we do introduce a noise in our solution uh, because the, the, the exact solution um, um, is only retrieved for the case of uh, zero Poisson's ratio. Yeah. So we, we, but we, we, we compared the results and they match well, but we have this noise around our numerical solution due to the fact that we have um, non-zero Poisson's ratio in it. Yeah. <clears throat> Another question, which is slightly out of okay, my topic. Yes. You mentioned that uh, you have a model for uh, <clears throat> failure in compression. How do you control interpenetration inter of, of lattice elements into each other? So after you fail one element, that well, basically <coughs> gets into yes. So for the for the um, simple damage model that I put uh, for compression. Yes. Model. For the simple damage model, where we only have the damage, we wouldn't be able to control this at all. For the, um, for the compression model, um, we, we are able to control it to a certain extent because our unloading stiffness is not going back to the origin. So it's reduced to a certain amount, but um, we still have here, um, for instance, if we go now back here and unload, uh, we still have a large proportion of the stiffness remaining because we have this damage plasticity approach. So if you would go there to compression, there would be still um, interaction of the same element, of course, because we keep connectivity the same. I mean, we don't change connectivity in the lattice model. But the, yeah, we would have then still the stiffness left to avoid that there's a, um, a overlapping of this element. Yeah.
Thank you, Peter, for a very interesting lecture. The, I'm struggling to understand in your 2D model, thick wall cylinder, you have those two patterns. You know, one, when elasticity, you have three cracks, and when you have power elasticity, you have two cracks. So I can, I can see that I think that one is stable, one crack pattern is stable, the other one is unstable. But I mean, can you give us some insight as to why there are three and, uh, and two in the other side? Or? I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just know we, we, we observed this in our um, result of our analysis. And um, the, the, well, the honest answer is I don't know. But we repeated these analyses and we looked at different measures and different step sizes because we were worried that this might be something that is uh, like some, some artifact coming from somewhere. And in all these simulations we had for this large bio coefficient of one, we ended up with these two um, crack planes, whereas for small bio coefficients that correspond more to the elastic case, we ended up with this three. Uh. When you look at, at the when you look at the sequence, I suppose that one is starting, initiates. So you, I mean, you don't initiate at the same time. No, I mean, if you, if you look at this um, crack patterns that I show here, yeah. I don't know if you can see this from further away, but there are two colors shown for these crack, cracks. Uh, one are the red ones are the cross sections of the mechanical elements in which um, damage is still active at this stage. Um, so these are, you could, would, would imagine in my model, I have always initially some distributed cracking occurring uh, because of this crack band type of approach I use, and then the cracks localize. So here, for instance, you can see some, some two areas here where there are some gray areas where, um, maybe you can't, but where the crack started to propagate, and then at a certain point they're unloaded, and the dominant crack where these three that continue to load and to propagate. Whereas here for the um, case of a very large bio coefficient, we, we don't have this really like that. So we really, there's some little bit of distributed cracking happening initially, but then we really have only these two cracks going outwards like that. Um, so, well, I have to be, I mean, I have to be honest that I don't really know exactly what the reason for this is. Thank you for a nice presentation. <clears throat> I have one question. Uh, is there a limit on uh, discretization length or size of uh, your elements in order to be able to represent realistic toughness of the material or uh, resistance to fracture? Um, I, I think. I, I don't know what this limit really is, um, because most of the applications we were looking in the past where we compared it to experimental results were situations where we have um, a rather large fracture poses on, and we, 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 have, we have quite a fine resolution when we compare the size of the elements compared to the length of the fracture process on. So we didn't really look at situations where a fracture process on would be a few centimeters and we would need to use elements which are much, much larger than that. Um, uh, numerically, we, um, for the case of the thick wall cylinder, we looked also at size effect, and we um, just scaled up everything by re inversely reducing the fracture energy that we put into our model, and we had a very small fracture process zone for large elements, and we were, we were able to reproduce the, the bounds, but we didn't really look in detail at the like, load displacement curves that we obtained for these problems. But I think it's like a, what I presented here is like a nonlinear fracture mechanics approach um, where we model really the fracture process zone with our lattice elements. And, um, uh, and, and mainly for initially intended for situations where a repro reproduction of the fracture process zone is of importance, where you need to take it into account. Yeah. And, and I could imagine in the limit you should end up then with a linear elastic fracture mechanic solution if you um, scale up your problem, but you might end up with numerical issues when you do this. And you probably know more about these problems than I do because simply of the applications that I have selected so far, which usually included situations where you had a large fracture post zone. We exhausted time, uh, so <laughs> please continue this discussion at the reception, but now please join me. <laughs>